Test one, two, three. Join me. I had some problems to activate my camera, but I would be happy if someone else would join me so that we can have a little chat. <laughs> Here's my hair. <laughs> cool. Hi, Owen. All right. How are you? Good. So I missed all the talks of today. The same. Oh. What was the highlight of today? You missed all the talks? Yes, unfortunately. Oh, they were wonderful. Yeah, I think so. Um, what was the magic about the new uh, web console for Groovy? Oh, I missed the web console talk, and I'm, I'm rather disappointed about that because um, Guillaume is usually um, very insightful um, with his talks. But um, I caught the extensions, and I'm, I've always been uh, paying attention to uh, Groovy and the uh, parser. Uh, I've been paying really close attention to the uh, parser, the pair parser, the, uh, because I've been uh, really looking forward to that coming out. Well, it, it did come out. <laughs> and it's, it's fantastic. The parrot parser is just magnificent. It just, it, it's so much better, so much faster. Uh, and it has, uh, as I've told many people who have uh, initially experienced Groovy and then just gave up on it um, way back when, that it has made tremendous strides and tremendous improvements that uh, they probably wouldn't even recognize it now. But okay. Is it now possible to, to use the parser to pass groovy code with comments and rewrite it? That was my main problem with the old parser. Commas? You, you know, I, I once had the problem that I wanted to to um, pass uh, groovy config files, um, re change them, rewrite them, and write them back. And my main problem was always that um, even the normal parser just um, um, throws away the comments. So that you can't really rewrite the code, and I was hoping that the new Parrot parser would uh, solve this problem. Not semicolons, but I think comments. it comments. Oh, yeah. comments! Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. My apologies. So I have a question about but, the whole Groovy thing, right? I mean, it's been there for almost ten years plus now, right? So. Uh, where is the? Uh, I'm really trying. I'm having a hard time convincing my core developers to adapt to Groovy. I personally like it. I think it's a great tool. But where is the heading? And is there? Sorry for asking the wrong question. But is there like a future really there out there for Groovy for some more time? Or I mean, is, is the competition too heavy for Groovy with Kotlin and other things? Oh, well, Colin, a lot of the libraries, um, this is one, one of the reasons why I haven't really adopted Colin, is because um, Colin, if you look at the libraries for, for Colin, it's mainly built for Android. Um, it, if you go onto um, GitHub and everything and do a lookup for all of the libraries for Colin, all of the libraries are built specifically for Android development and for mobile development. That's literally why it was built. 
Um, and while people are trying to use it for other things, it really hasn't caught on. And Groovy was always used for web development. It was used for web development and then caught on to DevOps. And so there's already a big development community with tons of libraries and tons of plugins. The one complaint I have is while Grails developed a, a community to provide a lot of plugins in Grails 2, and then a little in Grails 3, they literally cut it off the community for plugins in Grails 4. The only people providing plugins are OCI. There's nobody else providing plugins for Grails anymore outside of OCI. Well, and myself. Wait, is it, is it by design or is that, is that? It's, uh, yeah. you would have to ask them. Uh, I think it's for control. Um, and in some case, uh, to play devil's advocate for them, um, in a lot of cases, um, maintaining control over plugins is a, is a positive thing in that they can, um, like Microsoft, they can maintain, um, you know, a, a, a cohesive um, way of releasing everything. But at the same time, you know, what was provided with community in, in Grails 2 and Grails 3 is that you don't have this plethora of choice. Um, at the same time, that plethora of choice isn't cohesive and well-tested and everything. But um, what isn't well-tested well and everything can, um, you can overcome that, uh, I believe. Um, one of one of the things. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Ralph. You had something to say. Please do. No, it's okay. It's yeah. uh, just go on. Yeah, I have a question. So, so, so here's the thing, right? You mentioned. I think you're very nice, Rubel. You mentioned uh, very nicely about the DevOps side of things, right? Uh, one of the things I I am a I'm a Java programmer. I started. I'm a GUI programmer, and now I'm learning Python, right? Mm. I see so many advantages in Groovy. I still don't understand why Python is popular for whatever reason it is, right? But you mentioned about Groovy being uh, one of the tools for the DevOps people, right? I'm in DevOps now, and I would love to use Groovy for the various things it offers. Yet I'm having a hard time selling it to my coworkers because they're all like, oh, there is Python. And I'm like, yes, Python has one advantage, that is, Python interpreter is built into the OS pretty much, right? It's a part of the OS. Any Linux OS has it. So how do you see that? I, I can answer this really well. I, I just talked to somebody um, who I, I sold it to them really well um, by describing it this way. Um, all of those languages like PHP and Python and and uh, even uh, Perl. They are scripting languages which provide you with a way to develop really, really fast because they're, um, they're dynamic. And Groovy provides that. But the problem with all of them is that at a certain point, you need to be scalable in your production environment. And when it comes to that, Basically, all of that code just gets chucked and you rewrite it all in Java. That's what all of those environments come down to. And people just accept that, that at some point, we are going to chuck all of our Python code, chuck all of our PHP, Facebook had to do that, chuck all of our Perl and rewrite everything in Java. But Groovy bypasses all of this. It enables you to have a dynamic code environment where you can code really, really fast. And then when it comes time for production, statically compile it. You can have compile static on your code if you want, or write it as strict as you want. And then you have a very fast production ready purpose. So you have the best of both worlds. You have fast development time and fast production ready code, if you want. You never have to chuck out that code base at any point in time. 
Oh, and that sounds like uh, Groovy would be perfect everywhere. Yeah. But what I see is that it depends on the domain. And for instance, with uh, machine learning and uh, um, um, artificial intelligence domain, um, most books and most examples um, use uh, Python uh, or C++. And um, it's even hard to get, uh, for instance, OpenCV compiled for, for Java. And then when you compare the startup times, um, I often work, uh, play around on a Raspberry Pi. And on a Raspberry Pi, hey, it's, it's really hard to get groovy started. When it runs, I think it runs, but it also is a memory hawk. I have yeah. um, a ah. Raspberry Pi cluster that I run um, full featured um, uh, API clusters on. Um, so with which with Raspberry Pi is it? It is a Pi 4 or? Pi 2. Pi 2, OK. Yeah. But I currently experiment with a Pi Zero and yeah. OpenCV with Python runs fine on it. But uh, as far as I remember, you can't start even start Groovy on it. What? No. No, I run with uh, a Pi 2 with no Wi-Fi. So that um, if, if you cut out the Wi-Fi, it, that, that cuts down a lot of the processing power. That way you have to um, uh, you have to handle the networking by by hand um, through uh, the connections through all of the devices. Um, the Wi-Fi is is a huge huge overhead on the. Device. Interesting to hear. I wasn't aware of this. Yeah, which is why I, I went with the Pi Two because Pi Two, I, I believe it's the Pi Two, does not have Wi-Fi. If I just don't have Wi-Fi on them, I'm forced to use networking by, by hand and to network by hand. And it doesn't even give me the option to use Wi-Fi. Is the problem the network layer or just the Wi-Fi layer? I often uh, use um, network over uh, USB with a Pi Zero, which is quite nice. You plug it into your USB port and provide it through this USB port with power and uh, get network. And uh, well, I'm curious whether this is also a performance problem. The problem is a lot of things. I mean, the Raspberry Pi runs on, um, on effectively five volts. <laughs> and you're asking it to do quite a bit of that five volts. Um, and uh, the networking is, is a big hog. Of, of power because I mean it, it it's constantly listening and um, and 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 checking and uh, arm it, it's arm is not your your typical 386 uh, prop um, it's it's very very optimized on power and and it creates very minimal amounts of heat and everything um and you can run groovy and everything on it um, the thing with Groovy and what is that um, it needs a little a little bit of memory. It needs a little bit more memory. It needs a little more processing power. And all depending upon what you're doing, you have to optimize what you're, what you're processing, um, what you're loading, what you're processing, so on and so forth for, for the arm for the amount of memory you're doing. Oh, and also, you have to optimize Java. Um, you have to optimize your, your Java process um, for, for what you're doing. It's not so much uh, groovy, it's uh, your, your Java process, uh, how much memory it's using. Because your Raspberry Pi, your IoT device, only has so much memory that it can use, and Java is a hog. So if when you are setting up your Java process um, you know, in Java Home or whatever, declare your XMX and, and everything uh, so that how much memory it uses. Uh, I 
I actually have a good example. Oh, here, wait, I can do it here. Um, I have a good example of that if you give me a second to pull it up. Um, so that would be quite interesting to give a try to optimize Java to let it run on uh, Pi Zero and uh, maybe compare it with uh, Python um, with OpenCV. Pi Zero is very, very minimal on memory. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it has practically nothing for memory, so it's 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 a rough one to to try and run Groovy on. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, you just have to optimize your JVM args. Here we go. Uh, where am I at? I'm back over here. Yeah. Um. So all your JVM args. That you would normally. Uh, oh, it doesn't like that. Uh, okay, I'll just go with that. So your JVM args for for memory and everything. Um, that's what those are. What I use for server. Um, you would have those down to like two fifty six and five twelve. Uh, megabytes for a Raspberry Pi. Okay. The the XMS and XMX. XMX. And I think it, I it run do fine. Try. I mean, you could have it at five twelve, and you know, one gigabyte, but. I want it because you need to have a buffer for the uh, other other things that are running and the OS itself. So 256, 512 um, should run fine. It'll be a little slow, um, but that's to be expected. It's a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> most of the time I, I use uh, Groovy as uh, glue logic and um, then the, the speed uh, doesn't matter so much. I mean, that's the thing with uh, OpenCV and Python. Um, it doesn't matter how fast or slow Python is. It just uh, calls the C++ uh, functions of, uh, of OpenCV. And that's it. And yeah, I well, guess that, uh, that Groovy will also do the trick. Uh, I, I actually um, will use Groovy to call shell commands um, because the shell commands are written in C. Uh, I, I just use it to, uh, yeah, because I'm like, shell commands are written in C. I don't have to rewrite them. It doesn't use extra memory. There we go. What's this? What what do you call it? Shortmans? Shortmans, yeah. Um, so a uh, classic example, um, like for instance, in my um, integration tests, I will just, rather than um, writing something to uh, call a URL, I will just call curl. Ah. A shell command. A shell script. Well, but, it's not a shell uh, script, it's a shell command. <laughs> Curl is a shell command. Ah, uh, now I, I got a, a word. I, I had a problem to, to understand it um, with I, my, my American <laughs> accent. German um, hearing um, shell command. So, yeah, I, I also often use them, but um, I, yeah, when I code in Groovy, I, um, often use for instance git commands through the execute method uh, or evil and um, i fear that um, this starts off a new thread and uh, thus is not as fast as if i would use a java git uh, library but then it most of the time runs fast enough no, no, actually, uh, I found in a lot of cases, if you just use the, the, the shell command, you're just pawning it off into the OS. 
and the OS is already running in the background, and it's it's fine. It you're you're not using additional memory. You're not having to um, throw it onto um, your Groovy script or or create additional calls or anything. It's it's already up. It's running. It's and it's written in C usually. Most of these commands are but, all. But it will have to start another thread. So it will, this... but it's a faster thread, usually. Yeah. It's it's a faster interesting, thread. very interesting. Yeah. If if you think about it, it's a faster thread, and it's it's separated from your process, and it'll be associated with the OS, and and it actually runs really fast. The one problem that I have personally is that when you do things like that, you're asking people to install on a specific OS or, <laughs> or to install curl or have curl pre-installed or things like that. That can get problematic. But as long as you're not asking for really weird things, it's not, not too tough. But I mean, um, basic things like uh, curl or git, uh, yeah. I guess you can expect that a developer has uh, installed it on, on his machine or git is installed on, on a build server. Yeah. So it shouldn't be a problem. Not too much, when no. it comes to other tools like Pandoc uh, <laughs> to convert some files, yeah, OK. But there's also not a library which uh, could replace Pandoc. So uh, then, then you're you're talking about building a a um, you know an Ubuntu app repository or something to install all the tools with your with your application or what? And I mean, to be honest, uh, nowadays you put all those tools in a container and run it as a container. So yeah, yeah, I guess that's the way how we abstract things away nowadays. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> that's an entirely clever conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it so often that, um, no, you don't have to install it. You just run it on a container in Docker and uh, you have Docker installed, uh, haven't you? And yeah. I try to avoid that because a jar is a container. And if you just set up your properties file or what, um, I mean, literally all, all most jars take is just setting up your environment and installing the jar. And that can be done through DevOps. Uh, I mean, Send to production, install your property files on production, restart the production machine, <laughs> or restart the secondary production machine, or restart the tertiary production machine, or whatever. It's like you're losing some some processing speed and everything if, if you're doing things in, in containers and things like that. Sure, they're easier to manage and spin up and things like that, but all the all the processing power you lose when you're putting a container in a container <laughs> is kind of silly. I mean, a jar is a container, but uh, do you uh, know the feeling when you give a workshop and um, the first people run into problems with uh, the code and uh, then you take a look at their machine and, oh, your Java version is far too old. And then people install yeah, the most current version, and it also doesn't run, and you have to say, oh, your Java version now is far too True. fresh. True. I mean, it's like, sure, absolutely, absolutely. It's like for the, for the beginners, yes, Docker, great. For an experienced crew, DevOps. <laughs> you but... Um, you should doesn't have, have a uh, SDK man now this this great feature that it can install the exact 
needed Java version and other um, SDK versions. I think this is an env command or something like this. SDK man can't install the, the version? I think yes, there was something new. Um, because I just used that the other day with explicitly declaring a version. Wait a moment, here is the link. Take a look at this. Okay, let's, let's see here. So SDK env init creates a file in which the versions are stored, for instance, the Java version. And with SDK env, you can switch to the right versions. I think this is a cool feature. Hmm. Uh, I see. It may be a uh... So you're saying it in is not working properly or? I, I think it is working properly, uh, but I I haven't tried it yet. I think this, this would uh, solve problems for workshops. Mm, most definitely, yeah. When, when people have uh, the wrong Java version installed, but even better is if you have a, a virtual environment like uh, Gitpod. Do you know about Gitpod? Gitpod? Gitpod.io. It's a great tool. Oh. Gitpod.io. So um, yeah. if you go to a, a, a GitHub or a GitLab or Bitbucket repository and you prefix the URL with Gitpod.io and hash, then um, Gitpod will ask you for a login and then connect to your repository, create a container, clone the repository into this container, start a virtual web-based development environment, which is, uh, I think it's called Teia, um, the, the, the IDE, which looks exactly like Visual Studio Code. And you're ready to work because you have a console with with a running operating system into which um, your project has been cloned. Huh. And, very uh, nice. Yes. I use it really often because, for instance, if you want to make a small change in an open source uh, project, um, you just start this environment. You can run tests in the environment, do some coding, and when you are ready, you just uh, commit and push and uh, throw away the environment. You can you can make tests in the environment if you have the uh, configuration uh, installed as well. How would you how would you set up your configuration for that? Uh, for that, you can um, specify a Docker file if you want to, if the standard Docker file is not enough for you. And you can uh, set up some, um, yeah, I'm set up script. Test that out. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's nice. I'm going to test that out. Very yeah, beautiful. It's... Thank you. It's even even if uh, your um, your Docker image opens a new port because you started a web server, it, it comes up with a notification: "Hey, a new port has been opened. Do you want to open it in another browser window?" That's nice. I'm going to definitely test that out. Oh, that's that's beautiful. 
last year we used it to um, to program for the advent of code in our group. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I can see how that would be really, really useful. In fact, just for, um, you know, demoing your project really, really quick, that would be useful too. And, and you can share workspaces. That as well. Oh, gosh, they, my mind's just thinking about all the ways that you can use that. <laughs> That's really, really neat. I mean, and the best about conference. it is, yeah, at a conference like this, you could everybody could just spin things off. Exactly, and um, they need to sell the on-premise version but it's now open source. So if you have um, all the needed tools up and running to install it, you can even install it on premise. Oh, that would be lovely. I am definitely going to check this out and probably start using this. Are you affiliated with them? Uh, no. Oh. I was only happy when I uh, first saw it and uh, I thought this is such a great idea, and um, I started to use it uh, quite uh, from from the start. I mean, it's it's just very easy to use, and um, for those open source uh, projects I work on, uh, is a free tier um, enough? Let's hold on just one second. Are you on LinkedIn, Ralph? Um, yes. Uh, is it okay if I uh, link to you? Yes, sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me find you real quick. <laughs> Mula. Oh, there uh, you are. I guess. I think I found there are more. Are yes. Ed, oh, uh, Usinjin? Wait a moment. Oh, that's the name of the company, I think, Ralph Miller, OHG. Uh, I found you. Okay, send me a connect. <laughs> okay. I'm a little easier to find, I guess. Yes, um, Müller is a um, uh, common most name. common name in Germany, yeah, and uh, Ralph is also okay, yeah. quite common. So it's, um, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, my, uh, mein Vater war auf Deutschland. Uh, oh, ah. Yeah. Um, uh, where from? It was Bavaria. Bavaria is very nice. I was born in Munich. Munich. I uh, went to um, API days in um, in Berlin um, several years ago. It was it was really really nice. I mean, the people there were lovely. They were just everybody was so nice. It was just wonderful. Yes, I mean. It always depends uh, on what kind of people you meet. <laughs> but most of the time, we Germans are... That, that really depends okay. on every country. <laughs> yeah. You can say that about every country. <laughs> but the people I met at the conference um, and just about everywhere... Uh, yeah, That's true. Pretty... Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I hit it off pretty well. Most everybody thought I was from there. <laughs> they were like, uh, because of my features, I guess, they're just like, we thought you were German. And uh, <laughs> uh, ich the uh, six more mountain, studied in Deutsch um, uh, daily. Uh, ich war so da, an der US Army. Ah, aber mein Deutsch ist sehr schlecht. 
Dein Deutsch ist gar nicht so schlecht. Es ist gut zu verstehen. <lacht> Sehr gut. Danke. Aber ja, uh, yeah, uh, unless I'm in the environment again, I, 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 all of it is just gone. Ja. <sighs> yeah. You know, um, with with foreign languages, it's always hard. And and uh, the problem I I see with not being a native English speaker is that uh, you always stick to yeah. In my case, uh, German. So I I attend those uh, German conferences, uh, give my talks in German, and um, <laughs> so I I don't have this big reach which i could have if i would leave my comfort zone there's nothing wrong and try with that. to give some there's nothing wrong with that uh, I, i i personally i i've actually my wife has been telling me she's like you need to practice your german you need to practice your german I mean, I'm especially now, you might be able to get some jobs in Germany and everything. And I've been really meaning to um, to practice my German again, specifically because it is my family's second language. And I'm like, I would like to. I would like to. <laughs> really no, I really. think the, interest, the interesting thing about this is that uh, you can... Uh, even if you don't know German, uh, you can get good jo uh, jobs in Germany um, because uh, especially in the IT sector, um, if uh, you're, you're used to it that uh, people speak English and then uh, most of the people also switch to English and um, it's quite normal. That's okay. But um, it helps if you speak German. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it's, And it's, it's always good for small talk. Yes, it is. It's it's very, very helpful. And it's very important to management as well. And it's it's one of those little extras that if you speak the native language, it it goes much further. You don't have to, so they say, but if you actually do, it goes much further. I have a good friend who has uh, whose origin is uh, from America. He he lived, I think, 30 years or longer in America, then went over to Germany, and um, now also lives uh, for quite some long time in uh, Germany and uh, speaks good German. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I find very interesting is nowadays when he uh, speaks English, <laughs> he uses German words and I asked him why do you do it and he answered because they better fit there is no word in English for what I wanted to say so I just used the German word it's funny yeah. sometimes there are several there are several German words that there there isn't an English word for a classic example is schadenfreude There's no yep. English example for Schadenfreude, but it's such a good word for for, for that. <laughs> okay. Kindergarten is also funny. Oh, kindergarten. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We actually have adopted so many German words into our English language. We've adopted German words without even knowing we've adopted German words. Feuerplatz. Feuerplatz. Yeah. Well, I mean, we still call it a fireplace, and we don't know why we call it a fireplace. We call it a fireplace because the Germans call it a fireplace, Feuerplatz. And the other way around, it's also quite funny that um, we adapted words where we think they are English, but they are not English. For instance, We call this not a cell phone, but a handy. <laughs> And everybody thinks that's an English word, 
but it isn't. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, with other they, with other they English words, candy means over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, that's that's Germany, and um, with with other words, I'm I'm quite happy that we have the English word and the German word. So um, we have uh, through this uh, several words for um, for a display. For and um, for a display or monitor, oh. and um, so it, it depends on whether we use the English term or the German term. What we what we mean, what we reference to, and so uh, sometimes um, the English terms enrich the German language, especially in the IT sector. Uh, interesting. Huh. It's it's just um, yeah most most uh, IT terms are from the English language even if uh, Konrad Zuse invented uh, the first uh, working computer but um, yeah if if you use the English term everybody knows um, that you mean some IT term. And if you use a German term, you uh, know it's it's something different. Really? Do you have any? Yeah, I mean, uh, now now if you ask me, it's it's hard to find a good example. Oh. But for instance, I think um, when we uh, talk about variables. Um, everybody knows that I will be talking about um, programming languages. Um, but uh, the German term would be Platzhalter. And we, when I um, uh, do mathematics with my son, then I talk about Platzhalter. Well, that would translates to placeholder. Yes. So maybe that's not a good example. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's you know you you you, the, it, you use it. The they don't trans the translations are never literal. Um, I've I found that. Um, you can't take translations literal um, all the time. And especially when it comes from um, with language, um, and, and especially with IT, when people are explaining things, there's what they mean and what they're saying. And oftentimes, especially when, when somebody is hurried, rushed, anxious, you have to imply what they mean versus what they are saying. Sometimes what they are saying does not match what they mean, and you can correct them, and they'll mean, yeah, 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 yeah. that's what I mean. And also, same thing with translation. Translation is not one for one all the time, either. Maybe an example is uh, do you use the term notebook for a mobile computer in america um notebook is one notebook is one um laptop is another yeah, yeah. so when we refer to a notebook everybody knows it's a laptop it's a mobile computer yeah. but the normal term i think in german would be notizbuch no Notice book. Ah. A notebook. A book where you take notes. Notizbuch. And if you use the German term Notizbuch, everybody knows it's just pen and paper. But the notebook is the computer. <laughs> and that's what I, I mean where I think that the English language enriches 
the German. Oh, fantastic. That's, that's a little weird. <laughs> you think so? I think it's unfortunate in some ways that you can't say no book in your own language without people getting confused. <laughs> yeah, in some ways I in some ways I think it's a little unfortunate that you can't say no no teeth book without people going, oh here's a pen and paper. Um <laughs> Yeah. I mean, um, when when you want to refer to pen and paper as book, well, what's the proper name for it but, without confusing it with a laptop? But at the same time, um, we we often, I mean, a classic example, uh, we refer to um, the place where we uh, kill animals as an abattoir. It's a French word. Um, we will also call it a kill floor, but the, the term is an abattoir. It's French word. We adopted it. Um, we adopt a lot of other people's words from other languages everywhere. So uh, I guess it makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it happens um, in many domains, but um, with a with a computer science, it's uh, for us special because for us everything is English, and if we switch to English terms, it's just computer science. Yeah, and uh, it's it's. I mean, we also borrow in in other domains from yeah. other languages. Yeah, that's that's normal. But I think it's uh, special in in computer science. Yeah, I. I, I see what you mean. It's it's not abnormal because we do it every single day with language. We adopt from other cultures and other languages everywhere, and it's not it's not abnormal. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just like, but you know, we do it too in English. So yeah, so it's just. Another word that we adopt, and we adopt it as part of our culture, and we move on. I don't know why exactly I'm, why I'm getting on it. <laughs> uh, I, it, I'm getting hung up on it because um, I, I, it's part of my my history that I want to become attached to and. I don't, because of my father and my grandfather and everything. So, for me, it's it's a personal history that I I, I want to bond with, and I, I haven't yet. <laughs> so, I guess it's it's something to do with that. Yep. But, yeah, that's that's yeah. But we were talking about Groovy. And yeah, you, you should be able to, if, if you do it on Raspberry Pi, all you have to do is just um, reduce your memory. And um, you, you should, don't do it on, on, on zeros though. Um, do it on a, um, you know, a regular Raspberry Pi. And, and that, that should be a piece of cake. I think I will give it a try. I mean, um, uh, I, I had uh, some blog posts in the past where every time a new Raspberry Pi uh, uh, went to the market, I I tried to run Java and tried to run Groovy. And I think it was uh, only the Raspberry Pi, was it the three where I succeeded that it had out of the box enough memory Raspberry Pi is uh, free is good, and, and the thing is, because it has like two gigabytes of, of memory. If you really want to have a lot of fun with Groovy, go with Raspberry Pi 4, because you can get that with four gigs, or I think up to eight gigs now. Yes. So <laughs> it will really be performant on the four now. So, 
you shouldn't have any problem with that one. But you know, just to run a hello world, yeah, it's <laughs> oh no, no, I mean, you, on, on the older models, you can, you just have to um uh change your JVM args. The default JVM args assume like one gig. Uh, out of the box, they just are like, bam, one gig, and you've got to change that default. <laughs> but, but compare the languages. I mean, um, Python just runs out of a box on on each machine. There's even a micro Python, and um, why isn't Java built in such a way that it checks, hey, how much memory is there? Okay, I will grab some of it and uh, maybe I, I use some more later. Um, you know, that's a really good question. Why doesn't Java detect how much memory is on the system and then build its own JVM args for it? I don't know. <clears throat> that's a really good question, I mean, though. I mean, Java is the only language I experienced where you have to fine tune the memory arcs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the first computer with which you started? Oh, the very first computer? Um, it was an Atari um, 4200 or something. It, it had a bubble keyboard. Um, it was a home home system, and it, it had a tape drive, and I had to rewind back to the tape drive to program in BASIC and everything. It was back in the Atari 400. Something which, like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I also had one which was quite big and had this, this lid on top where you could add some extra modules. Yeah. Yeah. I remember this uh, when I started to collect uh, uh, computers. Um, I I tried to get a hold of one and got one, um, but never really worked on this keyboard. I, I had the pleasure to have a Atari 800XL, which yeah. already had a proper keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we did. We didn't have a proper keyboard. We had that bubble keyboard. Which sucked. Yeah. <laughs> and I think after yeah, that, but... uh, in our school, we had um, the uh, the Max. Um, we had the Mac 2, um, which it, it wasn't the, um, or uh, the Apple IIe, the Apple IIe's. Um, yes. And then, you know, we I went through a whole bunch of them, but... The most fun I had was in college in 1989 when I was on, on dumb terminals with a Vax account. And um, I was like mudding and with Pine and Emacs and stuff like that. And that's when I really fell in love. And I was just like, this is going to change the world. I was like, this is the internet. It's like not the web, this is the internet, and this is going to fucking change the world. And I sold the university on it, and it was just like, this, you've got to put more money into this. You have no idea. I showed them that I got a teacher to teach his classes online and a few other things. It's back in 1989, and it was just, just, completely blew my mind. It was as, as a result of that, that I, I mean, doing that, and then I, I started dumpster diving for manuals and everything, um, that I got my job at Amazon. Cool. Oh, I, yeah, I, I remember more, at, at university when we had access to um, those Unix machines, we used them to uh, solve our um, programming challenges uh, for the um, for the courses we we took, but most of the time we used them to play um, Bomberman over the network. To play what? Bomberman. 
Bumper Man? Bumper Man was already running on those uh, Unix machines. Bumper Man. Uh, let's Google for this. Oh, there are so many versions out there. I, I don't know, but this this looks. Uh, no, it looks like a version on on a Windows machine. Wait, you mean Bomberman? Bomberman. Bomberman. Oh, okay. Bomberman. Yeah. yeah Bomberman. Um, oh, okay. Looks like this one. <clears throat> We had lots of fun playing this over the network. Uh, yeah. On those quite expensive machines. <laughs> Holy cow, you had graphics. See, we played Yeah, we We played MUDs. Do you know what a MUD is? Massive online I don't know. I, uh, it's it's a multi-user database or multi. Multi-user. It's a. I. It's what there was before Morpeds, um, purely text-based. Do you remember the Infocom games? I do remember Infocom games. It it it's basically like Infocom except like. Hundreds of people could be logged in at the same time, interacting with each other. Never experienced this, but I, I was a big fan of, of Infocom games and uh, their copy protection mechanism. <laughs> that never worked. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think. I think I, I um, how should I put it? Um, many people tried to solve some of those games, but didn't realize that they didn't have the right clue, which was part of the package. Oh, the packaging. Yeah, I mean, there, there were so many. Um, brochures, leaflets, how you call it, uh, within the, the packaging. And yeah. somewhere in there was an important clue yeah. so that yeah. you are able to solve it. Yeah, absolutely. And it was hidden in such a way that if you copy the game, you you won't notice it that um, you didn't. That's true. Like uh, Zork and, and, and the others, they, they did that. They, they had like all this history uh, that came with the game that you had to read and go through. And uh, yeah, that was very, very important to uh, an important piece of the game. Yeah. Exactly. It was a multimedia you... part that was very important to the game. Do you remember that the old machines like the Atari 8-bit, 8 8 -bit, um, you just turned it on and it was immediately ready to code? Oh, yeah. yeah. And the Unix machines, okay, you just had to quickly boot the terminal and the main machine was never rebooted. And then there was a time when I switched to a PC and I noticed, okay, I have to boot it. I, if it crashes, I, I'm not allowed to just switch it off and on again. And nowadays, we try to get those machines in a hibernate state so that it, they turn immediately on again. But we do not reach it, reach the state like we had in those days i'm going to show you something um <laughs> i'm going to show you something <laughs> do you know anything no i'm curious do you know anything about apis 
A little bit. <laughs> okay. You might enjoy this then. Um, you'll have to look at this in your spare time. But one of the problems with APIs is that um, the things like open API and RAML and everything um, are duplicates of the state of all of those uh, annotations we have at the controllers. And you can't, if, if you want to make a change to your API, you can't make a change without reloading those. And in order to recreate that document, you have to restart your application because all of that data is hard coded at, at your, um, in your application. And this is one of the problems with the API pattern. It's because it's based upon a 1970s um, single tier pattern. But I rewrote wrote the pattern a long time ago uh, so that I could reload that data on the fly. And I demo it in that video so that you can reload it without having to restart your application or any part of your architecture. You just reload the document, poof, all of your API endpoints can have you know, new roles so that I can add a role on the fly if I want to add an administrative role for an endpoint. Poof, I add it on the fly, now restarting the server. Or if I want to change how an endpoint is called, poof, it's done. Now we're starting the server, 100% uptime. Stuff like that. Okay. I'm now quite impressed that uh, we just touch a topic and you have already a YouTube video prepared. Don't mind. <laughs> uh, I don't mind. Um, but now, um, that sounds interesting. I mean, it's also with, uh, to go back to Groovy, I mean, all those dynamic features of Groovy also allow us to change easily behavior without um, having to recompile our code. I mean, yeah. that's what, what Groovy often is used for um, yeah. in, in tools like Jenkins and, and other tools where and when I when I do Spring Boot development and I get a st stack trace, I always wonder about those lots of invoke yeah. dynamic statements where I think wouldn't have it make made sense to use a dynamic language to build Spring Boot just to avoid those invoke dynamic. I don't know, but <laughs> I it comes to my mind. I use a mixture of Spring Boot and Grails. I, I like knock out a lot of Grails, and I I I, I knock out a, a bit of Spring Boot, and I I use a combination of the two because there are some things that Spring Spring Boot does well. There are some things that Grails does well, and there's there are some things that both of them do crappy. When it comes to APIs, when it comes to APIs. Yeah, I think I have to do some more productive coding. I didn't use Grails now for a long time, unfortunately, and only got a glimpse of Micronaut. Oh. But what I've seen of Micronaut looks uh, really great. It's still, it's still in a, and I would still say it's still in a beta phase because okay. it, there are so many there there are so many errors that people are having still on on so many things that test it <laughs> try it out but um, Grails three stable as hell. Four is like they're they're calling it four point one. That's that's their fix, um, but there are a lot of errors all over the place. And it, it, I was so happy. I was so happy with Grails two because right. it it 
everything I needed. The plugin system was so easy to use. It was so easy to create a new plugin. And um, we created so many plugins that we we could create new applications just by putting those plugins together. Oh, you're, then we had our base application. You are preaching to the choir on that one. <laughs> yeah, there were so many plugins for the Grails 2 ecosystem. And, and even in Grails 3, we had tons of plugins, but yeah, they just, they just killed them all. Come, come Grails 4, they just killed everything. No more plugins, period. They just all killed. And there were so important plugins which I used for a simple login mechanism, like the uh, Shiro plugin by uh, Peter Ledbrook, which, yeah, I couldn't find in Grail 3. And, um, hmm. Yep. They, they no longer use that. They just use Spring Security, as far as I know. Mm. Spring Security is actually very good. Um, I've, I've used Spring Security forever. Um, yeah, sorry. Shiro is, I don't think, anymore, isn't maintained anymore. Um, I think they just forked everything into Spring Security. Yeah, but with uh, Spring Security, um, you can get things up and running but I don't have a good feeling with it. When I use the uh, OAuth 2 mechanisms, OpenID Connect um, seems not to be um, production ready yet. And um, I have problems with the refresh token. And um, when I take a look at uh, so many blog posts, they solve problems by self-implementing features and creating new filters. Well, here, let me send you this. <clears throat> I hate to toot my own horn, but if you have problems with OAuth and, and things like that, um, then I might be able to help you. Um, so one of the things that I do with my uh, API framework for Grails is that a lot of people, um, or not my OAuth framework, my, my API framework for Grails, is that a lot of people have the exact same problems that you have with OAuth and things like that. And I, I automate the OAuth so that people don't even have to deal with it. Um, it it's just, the authorization and the authentication are automated so that they don't even have to worry about it. Um, every user is given a token and the token management and handling is done for you. So you don't even have to think about it. Um, there are other things like webhooks. Webhooks are um, uh, auto-generated. It's uh, uh, automatically handled webhooks, everything. In fact, every endpoint can be um, hookable and batchable. And um, it, it automates almost all of the APIs, um, management and everything for you. Uh, let me just go ahead and send this to you. Uh, and you can take a look at the documentation. Use it or don't use it. I don't mind, I will not be offended. But um, for things like the problem that you're describing with OAuth, um, this might be a solution for you. And it, it, it sounds like it's implemented the way it is. It should be. I like to think you so. describe it. <laughs> I like to think so. I, I want it to be a plugin that is simple for everybody and takes away everybody's headaches of putting up an API server, putting up OAuth, managing all their endpoints, uh, API docs, generating the JS code for all of their API endpoints. I mean, all of that, I don't want people to have, 
APIs should not be a nightmare. It should not be something that becomes this enterprise only kind of situation. So exactly. I built this so that everybody can have a solution that is enterprise ready, um, meets all of the OWASP top 10 guidelines and everything. And it, it's literally one command to install. I will give it a try. Please, and if you have any problems, you have my LinkedIn and, and what, and can um, uh, get in touch with me. And I am pretty responsive about uh, problems. But again, if, if you don't want to, I mean, fear not, I won't be offended. Perfect. What time of day is it? Uh over at the States at the moment, at your location? It is 2 p.m. in the afternoon. What time is it there? It's uh, half past 11 in the afternoon. Huh. It's yep. night. Oh. <laughs> so it's, um, I think I, I have to, um, Shut down the the machine now and go to bed. Right. It was a pleasure to talk to you to ex exchange thoughts. Um, it was. Really I fun. only wonder who who was the third visitor in here in in this birds of a feather, whatever this was intended to be originally. It was great to to talk to you. Oh, it was really pleasant speaking with you. Okay. Have a nice day. Stay in touch. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.